So good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the 2023 uh, Unidate Space Security Conference. Let's jump to our first panel for the day, which is panel four of the conference. And this panel is on practical tools to facilitate space security, safety and sustainability. I am very pleased to introduce the moderator for this panel. Uh, Victoria Sampson sitting to my immediate left. Uh, she is the Washington Office Director of Secure World Foundation. So I'm going to hand it over to you so that you may introduce uh, the panel and uh, give any indications that you might want to uh, for the panel. I hand the floor over to you, Victoria. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Amadina. Um, as Amadina said, my name is Victoria Sampson. I'm with the Secure World Foundation. Um, we've been up here before, but just in case anyone who's new here today, we're a nonprofit that focuses on space sustainability, and we promote best practices and norms of behavior to make sure that space is accessible to and usable for all over the long term. And we're absolutely delighted to be a co-sponsor of this year's um, conference with our Good friends at Enadir. Um, we're excited to be talking about today practical tools to facilitate space security, safety, and sustainability, um, which cannot be achieved through any single initiative. There are multiple approaches and tools that are required. And so what we're going to be discussing this morning are practical tools and approaches that can complement and support multilateral processes. And these can include, but don't have to, uh, registration of space objects, notifications of launches, sharing of information on space security doctrines and policies, and analyses of how they can be implemented, used, monitored, and verified. Um, there's a couple um, Secure World and Unidare products that I want to bring your attention that we'll probably be discussing a little bit today. The first one is an excellent dossier put out by our good friends at Unidare on, on space verification and monitoring for space security. It came out in June of this year. Um, authored by Amadine Azgatate, um, Leticia Cesari, and James Revel. It's a really great overview, and I recommend everyone check it out. As well, you've probably heard us discuss numerous times, but you're going to hear it one more time. Um, a few products that we put out as well, um, the Space Security Lexicon, which uh, it contains acronyms, common definitions, and terminologies that require further cl clarification coming out of discussions and multilateral level on space security. Um, we hope that would help with transparency and common understandings in order to make some of these discussions maybe a little bit more fruitful. Um, as well, we have worked on the space security portal, which is an interactive map that um, looks at the global governance um, landscape for space security around the world. Um, if your country is not on the map yet, there is no um, shade intended. It's just that we haven't gotten the documents there. And if you'd like us to get you on the map, you can send the Unidir folks your documents. Otherwise, we are working to fill it in as quickly as possible. But we hope as well that'll help with transparency and common understanding as well. And then finally, I would not be a Secure World employee if I did not bring up our Global Counter Space Threat Assessment, which looks at counter space capabilities for 11 countries over five different methods. Um, the document is available on our website. Um, it's unclassified, it's in English, but we do have the executive summary translated in all six human languages. So um, again, it's available on our website at um, swfound.org slash counterspace. So with that, I'll stop with the advertisement and get to the real meat of the, um, this morning and our fantastic panelists. Our first one is coming at you all the way from California online. This is Krista Lageland, who's a physical scientist at the RAND Corporation, focusing on space strategy, deterrence, space cooperation, and the impact of emerging capabilities and technologies. She has developed frameworks to examine key issues for the development of space security um, strategy and policy, including the impact of space technology investments and possible approaches for increasing resilience in the space domain. Our second is Andrew Peebles, who's at the far end. Um, he's the external relations officer for the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, or UNUSA responsible for partnerships with UN member states and mobilizing donor fundraising. Before joining the United Nations, he worked for the United Kingdom Mission to the UN, covering the Intergovernmental Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, the Hague Code of Conduct against Ballistic Missile Proliferation, arms control exports via the Wassenaar Arrangement, and transnational organized crime at the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. Our third panelist is Dmitry Stefanovich. Um, he's a research fellow at the Primakov National Research Institute of World Economy and International Relations of the Russian Academy of Sciences. His research is focused on disruptive effects that emerging technologies have on strategic stability and nuclear deterrence, with space security being a primary focus of um, study. And then our fourth 
and final panelist is Juliana Swice, who is the research analyst and policy lead on space security as part of the military sciences team at the Royal United um, Services Institute of Russi. And she's the host of the podcast, War in Space. Her research, in, her research interests include global space governance, sustainability, counter space capabilities, and space warfare. So you can see we've got a wide variety of expertise represented in this panel. And so what I'd like to do is give each of our panelists the opportunity to make some just brief opening remarks and then we'll go into questions. Um, I have a few of my own I've set up, but we're open to, we'd love to have a discussion with the audience, both in person and online. So if you have questions online, please submit them via the, the proper channels. And if you're in person, be ready to raise your placard and we'll call you as best we can. So with that, our first speaker is Juliana. Take us away. Thank you very much, Victoria. It's great to be here this morning um, and to speak here with all of you. I have to say, when I came here yesterday, initially, I only saw problems. Um, and I specifically saw the problem of political will. Now, as you heard, uh, I'm an analyst, you know, working, working on space, but also looking at the wider geopolitical implications. So I also look at the way in which space security doesn't happen in a vacuum. And geopolitics obviously influences discussions as well. So I think if political will is lacking, it can't be forced. But I don't think that means that the whole process needs to be thrown out. And I think small steps uh, can be taken first until we are ready for the big steps. And I think we can use the momentum specifically from the OEWG um, that we discussed yesterday. I think specifically there's hope to be found in the realization that we are very reliant on space. Whether or not states are already space powers and active in space, they are most certainly users of space already. And I think the less destructive counter space uh, weapon development that we've seen and we've discussed with Brian yesterday is evidence for that shift. I think the underlying key to the tools that we're going to be discussing today is always going to be transparency. And I think that may sound very obvious, specifically if we were talking about other domains, but I think it's still tricky for space. And that's partly because the beginnings of space lie in the military and the projection of power. So, of course, there's secrecy around it. And I think this is still something, it's a legacy that we're still trying to overcome when we discuss space today. However, I think there's some things that should simply become common practice. And a lot of them relate to SSA, space situational awareness. And I think that's because we're all working really hard to try and reduce miscalculation and misunderstanding, which I think we've all realized is a, is a big potential threat area in the coming years. Among those practical, practical tools um, is the notification of launches. It's the notification of debris building. You as a space operator, whether that be commercial, whether that be states, you are tracking your assets better than anyone else. You know exactly what is happening to them. So if there is damage, fragmentation, and collision, do tell everybody. You know, the standardization of, of sort of catalogs uh, on a global level can only help. Also, the registration of space objects. And also, perhaps less a tool, but perhaps more an approach is around partnerships. I think becoming familiar with each other's ways of working and understanding of how we see space, how we conceptualize space and how we work in it uh, is only going to be a tool in the future for understanding and perhaps also for uh, avoiding misunderstanding and miscalculation in the future. I'm going to leave it at that because I think the, the real interesting part is going to be the discussion later on. So I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana, for that great start. Um, our next speaker is Dimitri. Well, uh, also, I'll try to be brief and leave some of my ideas to the discussion uh, section. Uh, well, first, actually, uh, I'm not really sure that we should have all these three words that we have in the name of our panel together. Uh, because, well, there is some difference between security and safety and sustainability. And obviously, safety and sustainability are more of the stuff that is on the agenda of the copios. Uh, well, personally, I'm uh, given my focus on uh, nuclear deterrence and arms control, as uh, you've mentioned, I'm more interested in hard security implications of space. Uh, well, and if we talk about practical tools for hard security, it's definitely transparency and confidence building. Uh, well, uh, the issue, the biggest issue, is actually the threat of uh, full-fledged weaponization of the outer space. Uh, still, it's not something inevitable. And uh, both weaponization and arms race 
uh, in outer space can be prevented. I am quite confident in that. One of the reasons for that is actually was already mentioned uh, by Juliana, because uh, countries are dependent on space assets, uh, whether those enable uh, their civilian or military operations. Uh, I believe that uh, one of the primary efforts should be focused on understanding the threat perceptions of different actors in outer space. Uh, the, and this effort should be carried out in good faith. Uh, I'm a strong believer that countries, uh, UN member states, and but also UN organizations, should always try to walk an extra mile to understand the foundations of these or that threat perceptions. Uh, only such approach will uh, let us move from uh, the current state of security di dilemma or basic concept that we see in space and elsewhere to indivisible security that is an ultimate goal which also made its way to some of the documents, but probably not to the minds uh, at least of some decision makers. Uh, counter space capabilities of all basing modes, kinetic and non-kinetic, uh, obviously exist and uh, they are being continuously uh, developed, refined, and we lack transparency, uh, not only about the capabilities themselves, but also about the objectives. And this might be actually one of the biggest issues, because about the capabilities themselves, we have wonderful Secure All Foundation report, uh, <laughs> at least. About the missions of these assets, we have uh, from time to time comments by officials. We lack uh, good uh, doctrines. We lack clear understanding of the operational concepts. Uh, still, the missions for counter space capabilities can be basically put into two major baskets. One basket is to achieve superiority, another is to deny superiority. Uh, it might be oversimplification, but I think this is uh, a useful framework for analysis. Naturally, these two baskets uh, contribute to the arms racing dynamics. And uh, Obviously, the stated end goal to prevent it is to have a legally binding instrument, a legally binding treaty, and achieve Paris. Uh, we'll see how the group of governmental experts who will uh, work on that. I have some hopes, but of course, I, we, yesterday we heard a number of challenges. Still, despite this major effort, uh, some sort of extra transparency and confidence building measures are possible uh, as like complementary interim mechanisms that can contribute to the end goal, to the legally binding end goal. Uh, just as a side note, uh, generally in current era of arms control, of strategic arms control, uh, it seems that there are very serious issues with having legally binding instruments. Uh, and uh, more and more countries, including Russia, including US, uh, are publicly saying that possibly some unilateral, parallel, non-legally binding measures can be useful. Although this is not because it is something good, but simply because it's better than nothing. Of course, we should always remember that legally binding mechanisms are by uh, b by a huge margin better than anything we can have on the uh, like political level on uh, norms on uh, unilateral initiatives uh, what should be the focus is uh, of the efforts that we hopefully will discuss today and we've partly touched upon yesterday the focus should be the increasing the predictability of uh, strategic situation in outer space and trust building uh, at the same time, we need to limit accidents, incidents, uh, which, again, is part of the job of the copios. And this is we have this link between like civilian space and military space. One of the possible ways uh, to address it is actually to go even further with notifications. Uh, personally, I'm a big fan of what we have uh, on uh, the Earth's surface, like uh, not AMS, not Mars, navigational warnings that are used when uh, tests of some long-range missiles take place or some exercises take place. This mechanism, of course, is imperfect, but still it works. Uh, and it provides quite a sufficient, not sufficient, but uh, r r uh, important level of transparency and confidence building. Of course, there are always cases when simply uh, some like fishermen or uh, uh, pilots ignore these warnings, but still there is a volume of data. Of course, for, with space, it is more complicated because we are talking not about areas, but more about volumes and orbits. 
but I do not see how it is impossible, and I hope this will be to some extent discussed on the official level. Uh, the obstacles on to arms, arms control are there, but it doesn't mean that we should not try. Uh, the problem with outer space is that, well, we see state and non-state actors uh, actively investing in their capabilities, uh, which means that they are definitely not interested in any limits or anything that can be perceived as limits to this development. How to address it? Well, again, through transparency, just explain how norms will not undermine the peaceful, uh, the development of space assets for peaceful use, while, of course, uh, the development of uh, tools for hostile use of outer space will have hardly be discussed in this case, which, again, doesn't mean that uh, these uh, <clears throat> efforts uh, are useless. Uh, and the, one of the most important issues is that um, great powers are dependent on space infrastructure. And uh, while they dis develop uh, some other enablers that will help them to achieve these or that goals without actually, like if the space will be denied, uh, still, I believe that, it, as uh, was mentioned, it should be uh, one of the major drivers for the great powers in space to actually pursue some sort of uh, first politically and legally binding mechanisms. Uh, what else to say here, not to waste more of your time. I think that uh, the idea about ASAT ban, about direct ascent ASAT ban, that was the initiative that was promoted by the US and supported by at least some countries, uh, is uh, an interesting one, but uh, a limited one. It, uh, we've heard yesterday the official Russian position that it is basically using one small part of the overall uh, issue. Still, I believe that it can be this initiative can be used to broaden the scope. Just let's talk not about ban on uh, one single capability. Let's talk about ban on any thro threat or use of force against critical space-based infrastructure, including ground stations, especially. If we talk about the capabilities that are linked to nuclear command control communications, uh, I understand that this is an extremely sensitive part, and uh, probably initially it should be some sort of like of a negative doctrine, negative uh, uh, statements. Not that we will not uh, tar uh, th these parts of our space infrastructure should not be targeted, but vice versa, we will never target this sort of infrastructure of our. Uh, partner or adversary, but uh, there are steps that can be taken. Uh, Russian focus on PPWT, on non-first placement of weapons and outer space commitments, uh, remains uh, relevant. Uh, I, it, a lot has been said about it yesterday, and I think we'll touch upon it today uh, again. Uh, the idea, again, is not only to have some sort of uh, joint understanding, but also to develop uh, um, joint mechanisms uh, to, that can enhance international peace and individual security that I've mentioned. Uh, with that, I think I'll stop uh, because, again, on the Russian position, a lot of things have been said yesterday. Uh, my final point would be that uh, the trends are definitely not positive, but uh, as practice shows, as history tells us, sometimes uh, when the situation is uh, the, the, the dangerous level of escalation in this other domain is acknowledged, it actually leads to mutually beneficial uh, joint efforts to reverse the trend. And that will stop and looking forward to our discussion. Great. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, our next speaker is Andrew. Thank you. And, and good morning, everybody. Um, before I kind of talk about a bit about what NUSA does. I would like to make this interactive and ask you guys if you could put up your hands, if you can confidently say what the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs actually does. So put your hand up if you know what it does. Two people, great, okay. So before I talk, I'm gonna, three people, great. Um, in a nutshell, 30 second um, elevator pitch. Um, ANUSA provides two main functions to to member states. Um, one of our functions is a secretariat function, so obviously we service member states within the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. We also maintain the, the UN Register of Objects launched into outer space on behalf of the Secretary-General. 
We also serve as a secretariat for various intergovernmental bodies on global navigation satellite systems, um, international asteroid warning networks, and space planning advisory missions. So, um, and we also lead UN efforts, UN interagency efforts across the UN system for the use of space for pe peaceful purposes. So that's our first function, the Secretariat. Our second function is as a capacity builder. And without kind of pitching all of our projects to you, I'll give you one tangible example of how we've worked with one country on their spacefaring journey, and that's Kenya. So with Kenya in 2019, we helped Kenya l deploy not launch, but deploy its first satellite from the International Space Station. That was a big success. We helped in our function as um, in, in maintaining the register of objects launched into outer space. We helped Kenya successfully register its first satellite with the United Nations. Um, that was a catalyst for the creation of the Kenyan Space Agency. And subsequently, we conducted a lot of scientific and technical um, projects with Kenya, for example, um, deploying um, Earth observation cameras on the International Space Station, or deploying um, or launching satellites from various um, from various rockets. And finally, um, we were in Kenya this year to help them develop their national space legislation. So you'll see there's a broader range of projects that we do offer member states. So if you're interested in starting your spacefaring journey, please do reach out to us. In terms of the, the panel discussion today, um, I would like to talk about two areas, which is firstly, um, our function as maintaining the register of objects launched into outer space and also the long-term sustainability guidelines. So the safety and sustainability elements of space activities. So for the register, um, since the start of the space age, um, member states of the United Nations have been registering satellites with the Secretary General. They do so in, in two, two main ways. Um, and I should just clarify, when I talk about the register of objects launched into outer space, there are actually two registers, and I'll talk about them in a second. So the first register is, was created following a 1961 resolution at the UN General Assembly, and that's Resolution 1721B. And that resolution allows all member states to register military and civilian satellites with the United Nations. And we do, and I'll talk about that in a while, we do receive um, registrations for both of those. The second register that we maintain is was a result of the 1976 Registration Convention, um, and that is obviously um, a, a legally binding um, obligation. So these two registers form the same function, it's just a different mechanism which allows member states to, to register with us. Um, and then we maintain all of this information on what is called the online index of objects launched into outer space. And you can find that online. So since 1957, um, we've received 88% uh, of all registered satellites. And in, in quantitative terms, that's 14,850 satellite notifications. And um, we've received 1,800 of those, so almost 10% within 2023 alone. So as you'll see, we're receiving a lot of um, mega or, or large constellations being registered. We started a, a project um, last year funded by the United Kingdom Space Agency, which aims to understand, which interviews member states to understand the, the good practices, the challenges, the lessons learned that they have with regards to registration. And we'll be publishing a uh, anonymized stakeholder study in um, almost one month's time, which will, will give you some of those findings. But I would like to briefly talk about a couple of those just now, which um, may be relevant for this discussion. So what we saw from some of the interviews was that member states acknowledged that um, registration in itself is the fundamental element of understanding who owns what in space. So you need to know um, an object needs to be registered to understand who, who it belongs to. And as, as member states negotiated in 2019, the long-term sustainability guidelines, the, there's a specific guideline within there which talks about enhancing the practice of registration. And paragraph one of that does say that inadequate registration practices may have negative implications for ensuring the safety of space operations. So you'll see there's a direct linkage there. Um, the stakeholder study will also talk about um, military satellites. It will talk, to, uh, will talk about how member states have different approaches to understanding how to register uh, and who should be the state of registry that would take on international obligations such as liability. Um, 
and it also talks about the eligibility criteria in which member states apply when licensing and authorising satellite launches. So again, the licensing and authorisation at the national level is a key part for the safe and sustainable use of outer space. Secondly, and I will wrap up in a second, um, the long-term sustainability guidelines were obviously a landmark output of Corpus in 2019. These were endorsed by the UN General Assembly. Um, just afterwards, um, we are supporting member states of the United Nations within Corpus, um, and specifically a working group on the long-term sustainability of outer space to tangibly look at how member states implement these in practice um, with a view to it maybe addressing gaps or challenges where those could be remedied through additional guidelines. The second key priority of that working group is um, capacity building, so ensuring that all member states understand that by implementing these guidelines, they are themselves creating a predictable regulatory environment for potential investors and creating um, a, a robust piece of national legislation. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned before, um, the third priority of that working group could be possible new guidelines, and that's where Corpus at the moment is at the, is at the forefront of discussing kind of new and novel areas with regards to space sustainability, such as in orbit servicing, active debris removal, um, the impact of mega constellations and cyber safety. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to answer any additional questions on that. Thank you. Great, thank you. And then our final speaker will be Krista, who's coming online. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity to participate. I, I wish I could be there in person. This is a very important discussion. Um, so I'm really grateful for this opportunity and I'm going to frame my comments um, based on some recent uh, relevant RAND work um, and uh, just thinking through what the implications, the findings from that work might be for how we can think through what this panel is talking about, tools and approaches to building space security, safety and sustainability. Um, so, first of all, RAND a couple of years ago, um, so not capturing all of the great work that has been done um, uh, at the UN and others since, but nevertheless, they completed a report on uh, responsible space behavior. And this report speaks about several pressing challenges that are not new to this audience. Um, these are all familiar to us, uh, the growing number of spacefaring nations, the lack of consensus on responsible space behavior, and the increasing congestion and competition in the space domain, all of this raising the risk of collision and other accidents, the potential for intentional and hostile threats to space assets. So noted in this report and by all of you that uh, these challenges are, so, some of these challenges are more well understood than others. Uh, so this is a key area for tool impact. Um, there remains a lot of debate on what is a danger in space, what is a threat, and how should we address those concerns that touch on national security and how should we balance national security and safety concerns. So one of the recommendations that came out of that report then um, is that the challenges of addressing safety concerns should be addressed first before turning to more complicated discussions about security activities. And I think that aligns with what Juliana was talking about a few moments ago, um, taking these, these smaller steps, um, even in the absence of political will. Uh, these are areas where there is uh, more clearly broad consensus on the need for action to protect the space domain, um, while some of these security concerns are more complicated and contentious and may involve issues such as uh, thinking about the development and deployment of space-based weapons. So focusing on safety considerations first, um, the report suggests that progress can be made more quickly and effectively, and that this can then help build trust and cooperation among space-faring nations. So once safety concerns have been addressed, then the trust and cooperation that has been built in this process can then support continued discussions about addressing some of these security issues. So the reason I'm walking through all that is that this highlights to me some key things that tools and approaches to building space security, safety, and sustainability should do. First, uh, based on the recommendations in that report and other RAND work, um, tools should look to help address space safety first. Uh, second, tools should help make the challenges facing actors in space more well understood. Uh, and third, trust and cooperation is a process that requires time and effort to build so tools should look to facilitate uh, building that trust and cooperation. 
So I'll briefly say a little bit more about each um, in my thinking there uh, on space safety and tools for space safety. Um, one, one key thing that sticks out here is better data sharing. So specifically, as space gets more congested and space objects become more maneuverable, uh, and there are more commercial actors in space, it is increasingly difficult to track everything up there. Uh, we talked to folks at the, the, the 18th uh, Space Defense Squadron and 19th and, and uh, understand very well the, the challenges uh, faced by, by keeping track of everything up there. Uh, one of the recommendations from the Responsible Space Behavior Report is to find ways to enhance space situational awareness through the development of technical solutions and technical tools um, that can improve tracking and identification of space objects uh, and improve data sharing and collaboration. So these technical tools can aid operators and help improve things like screening for conjunction assessment, and they can have a direct impact on space safety. Uh, data sharing tools similarly will enable better reporting of future maneuvers and sharing of information um, from owner operators. So building tools that are technical in nature um, and enable better communication and data sharing can have a direct impact on space safety. Um, the, the second uh, type of tool that, that I was thinking through here is tools for making challenges uh, and the threats felt by other actors more well understood. So identifying shared objectives is a key step here and space safety is one such shared objective. But a shared understanding of dangers and threats in space may not be um, always an achievable goal. Security concerns may continue to differ among different stakeholders. So while many actors are looking to balance security and safety concerns and may not always share objectives and priorities, avoiding inadvertent and accidental escalation can still be a shared objectives. So tools that help here will build a better understanding of the objectives of actors in the space so that actors in the space domain can have a, have a better view of the intent of actions taken in space. Uh, and thirdly, thinking about tools for building trust and cooperation, um, addressing safety concerns can help build trust, but further measures to build trust over time require better communication and transparency. Uh, so Rand did a lot of work on space security cooperation, including some recent research focused um, uh, on you know, lessons learned from other domains. and. Uh, one of the things that comes out of that is the importance of you know, building bilateral relationships. This is an important tool for building trust and transparency um, and uh, other tools and approaches that can encourage the development of bilateral information sharing and cooperation can help build a foundation for increased multilateral efforts. Uh, so overall tools that promote and enable transparency in operations and communication about space activity and behavior from actors can help build this trust among other space actors. So tools can accomplish this by establishing you know, shared language, shared policy, and improved communication. Uh, so in summary, I really looked at uh, preparing for this discussion of tools and approaches um, by thinking through what these tools should enable. So we need technical tools to enable information sharing. We need policy and regulation. Um, and relationship building to encourage and persuade space actors to share information. And we need actual data information and access points to be compiled to provide this information to stakeholders in space. So all of these categories of tools and approaches you know, broadly fall together under the umbrella of uh, information sharing and tools that can promote information sharing um, and we've had the potential for significant impact on space safety and security. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Okay, um, that was a great start from all our panelists. Um, I'd like to start off by just asking a few questions. Anyone on the panel can jump in. Krista, um, if you want to jump in, I guess you have a, you a raise your hand function. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that. But just kind of the first discussion, we've heard a lot of um, you know ideas about tools that can be helpful, and a lot of them seem to, seem to focus on information sharing and you know, active steps that states can take in this method. But of course, you know, how do you encourage states to actively participate in these activities, whether they're registering um, either satellites, whether they're notifying you know, launches, or if they're doing things like sharing information on SSA data or things of that nature? Are there existing barriers to greater participation? And um, you know, just spitballing here, but if there, you know, Unidir is a secure world space security portal, UNUS is a new registration portal, how do we ensure the success of these tools? 
So that which panelist wants to start off with that? Juliana? I can. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and perhaps the, the diplomats in the room would be better placed to, to answer this. But uh, speaking from someone who sort of started on the space portfolio two years ago, there's so much to be learned. And the topic itself is so vast that uh, I can only imagine that especially smaller missions where diplomats sit across, you know, many different portfolios. And um, there's a lot to be learned in a short amount of time. And I think the tools such as the Unity Lexicon, for example, um, that was um, that was published would be would be hugely helpful uh, in sort of understanding these issues uh, and being able to sort of have the research sort of handed to you uh, almost on a silver platter. And I think the SWF counter space uh, threat assessment report is among those tools as well that have certainly saved me a lot of time uh, in going immediately to the sort of source and finding information um, very quickly. And I think specifically going uh, to the lexicon and the definitions, um, I think it can be very easy to get held up by definitions and to talk about definitions over a long period of time, which I think can sometimes be an obstacle to actually getting to a consensus and actually finding common ground and having definitions handed to you already through a lexicon that sort of goes through the potential um, different perspectives and angles uh, of a term can definitely help sort of speed up that process. Great, thank you. So what about the rest of the panel? Thinking about active participation, existing barriers. Uh, was, again, Dimitri. Again, people pursue these or that measures uh, not because they find it like uh, good for all mankind, but probably because it can help them pursue their national interests. And in this case, national security interests that are related to uh, space activities. Uh, I think that actually one somewhat uh, counterintuitive way to do it, and it is somewhat related to lexicon as well, is when uh, there is a widely shared but entirely wrong perception about this or that capability, it might force this other state to, well, produce some sort of uh, an explanation, uh, a fact sheet, or even a doctrine on why this or that capabilities exist. One example, again, from the nuclear domain is a uh, totally wrong capability uh, perception of uh, the Russian nuclear doctrine that was published in the previous U.S. nuclear posture review, which was at least partly a driver, at least it's assumed to the expert community, of Russia actually for the first time ever publishing a nuclear doctrine, a basic principles of state policy on nuclear deterrence. But personally, since that, I've constantly argued that we also need some sort of a state policy of, uh, uh, in the field of aerospace defense, but we, it remains to be seen. Uh, we see that the Americans are constantly publishing uh, documents uh, that are, can be amount to a space security doctrine, which are also questionable, but still at least there is, it is something to discuss. And this lexicon, it's also how lexicon is related here, and I think we'll talk about it later, is that uh, lexicon uh, also has some, well, not questionable, but contested definitions. Uh, I had an honor of participating in this project, but I think it should be acknowledged that it is not uh, like a final uh, thing at this cast in stone. It is basically a, a first step towards greater understanding. And there is uh, what I uh, know for sure that there are different schools of thought to put mind what comes first, the definitions or the agreement. Uh, I am oops, deeply entrenched in the camp of those who like glossaries and lexicons and definitions. And given the current state of uh, affairs, it is something much more doable than actual agreements. But And then I totally agree when the uh, situation is ripe for discussing actual agreements, when there's enough political will, at least some job is already done. Thank you. And just to clarify, I mean, I'm really glad you brought up that point with the space security lexicon, because as you said, it's not meant to be the end all and be all, you know, this is published and this is it. It's meant to be an iterative process, whereas I think definitions evolve and maybe some get more understanding and more um, comprehension, then we hope to be able to update the process and, you know, keep it as up to date as possible. But yeah, um, it's definitely not a, not a set standard in stone thing. Andrew, do you want to talk? Thanks. Obviously, I'm British, so I, one, of, one of our former UK Prime Ministers was Tony Blair, and he talked about the importance of education, education, education. Um, I'm going to change that now. I'm going to say, I'm going to say implementation, implementation, implementation. Mm -hmm. um, member states have negotiated the global governance of outer space activities. 
over the last 60 years, these are the treaties, the principles, the guidelines, the resolutions um, that form the basis for all of your space activities and the activities of, of industry under your jurisdiction. I think coming back to Dimitri's point around national interests, I think there needs to be a, a shift change in how member states perhaps see the need for robust national legislation. Um, so, for example, there's, there's some that argue, well, having having laws in place, having having regulations in place is, hinders our spacefaring activities. Well, actually, what we see as an USA is those countries that have robust legislation in place are able to are able to attract investment. They're able to work on a level playing field with other member states that have also ratified and signed international treaties and, and obligations. So there are substantial benefits to be had with being seen to be compliant with, with international commitments. Talking about how we can encourage people to actively participate, um, we also see that a lot of member states start their spacefaring journeys by looking at research and development, perhaps within their universities, and that is often a, a gateway for um, exploring the science, scientific and technical aspects of space in the absence of, of the legal um, capacity building side. So I think there's something to be said about increasing member states' capacity to be able to implement um, space law. Krista mentioned um, the lack of expert networks um, as well between member states and obviously coordination. Member states are, are often speaking to one another about their experiences and, and looking at models for how other member states have applied um, these international obligations. Um, lack of awareness on the need to register space objects is something that we've, we've also seen as, as a hindrance to perhaps transparency between member states. Um, the types of reasons that we see is, well, we don't need to register because we don't have national legislation. The, the other example is, well, we don't need to register because we haven't ratified the registration convention, despite there being um, a UN General Assembly Resolution 1721B. Um, member states also say we don't need to register space objects because um, our university launched this object. We didn't as the government. Well, actually, if your university launched a satellite, you're, you're officially a launching state, so congratulations. Um, and then finally, um, member states also don't need to... Uh, also necessarily don't see the need to register military satellites. And what we see as a new sir is member states do receive, uh, do notify the Secretary General through us on military objects. And I'll, I'll quote some of the, the words that people use when they, when they do so, when they um, provide the information on the function of the space object. So some member states say this is intended for assignments on behalf of the Ministry of Defence. Others say this is for military communication. Others say this is for Earth observation. Others say this is satellite conducting missions assigned by the government, and others say this spacecraft is engaged in practical applications. So member states are being transparent in our context. Member states are communicating with one another on military um, military aspects of, of space. Um, so I would encourage more to do so. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. And I just want to clarify a point that you made, because actually I had not heard that before. So if countries have signed the registration convention, then they have a legal obligation to register. But if you've not signed the registration convention, you have an um I don't know what the term is, an obligation, but you can you have the option of registering thanks to the UN General Assembly resolution. Is that correct? That's correct. So there's there's two main, two main ways to register objects with us. One is through treaty obligation, registration convention. The second is UN General Assembly Resolution 1721B. Both forms are absolutely identical. Um, ANUSA and member states of COPUS negotiated these forms over, over many years. They talk about the um, orbital parameters, the general function um, of the space object, um, and who owns it, who are the launching states, etc. So it's, there's just two, way in May, two ways to register, but one is legally binding, the other is a General Assembly resolution. Great. Thank you for the clarification. Um, I believe Krista has some thoughts on this matter. Krista? Thank you. To to reiterate uh, what's already been said a little bit, and then a couple of uh, additional thoughts. But um, but first and foremost, making these making the uh, making sharing easy, having things like the the registry of objects, making it clear how to register is is key. And there's a lot of efforts for that. I know that's part of the the discussion today. Um, but I really think once it's easy to do that, once it's clear, once the mechanism is there, there's a lot of interest in participating in this. Um, a lot of commercial operators are already volunteering um, information on upcoming maneuvers and ephemerides. Um, so 
making this easy, I think there's already a lot of actors that see the benefit to this sharing. Uh, there may not be a way to persuade all state actors to provide things like maneuver, uh, maneuver notification or all states to register um, all of their, their, their launches and assets, but, um, it, but with established standards for reporting in place and making it uh, clear and easy for actors that are interested in doing that, um, making it clear how they should do that, um, it's certainly easier to identify actors uh, that are behaving outside of the boundaries of their standards, um, and this could flag things for a, a closer look, so we could have a better understanding of um, intent. And I you know, certainly there's not a causal relationship between somebody choosing not to register and nefarious intent, but it can help with um, you know, a better understanding of, uh, of of what different actors are up to in space. But but I think there's a lot of motivation in place already. So so tools that can kind of uh, facilitate that better, I, I think would have a pretty significant uh, impact. Great, thank you, Krista. Um, so another question for the panel, the dual use and dual purpose nature of space systems was brought up a lot yesterday and it's often highlighted as an issue that can heighten space security concerns. How can transparency be encouraged while taking into account the essential dual nature of space systems? And can there be effective verification and monitoring mechanisms established that are able to be productive and helpful, but also acknowledge this dual nature and account? All right, Dimitri. Yeah, dual use is uh, one of the favorite topics of everyone who does stuff with space security, because basically, as again was correctly said in the beginning of our session, space originally was a military affair. Uh, and basically, most space assets, most space activities has something to do with national security. Uh, my favorite example, uh, uh, but at the same time, sometimes the actual capabilities that are being developed for some benign uh, effects uh, can be used for malign effects as well. One, my favorite example here is the so-called so the idea that there should be some sort of self-defense capabilities, active defense capabilities for satellites, for space objects, uh, which I think quite clearly uh, can be used against other satellites. So basically you start with defense, but you end up with having an offensive capability. And basically uh, it is textbook case textbook case of security dilemma. Another thing that is uh, highly important here is uh, both uh, the integration of space situational awareness and uh, uh, space satellite imaging of Earth's surface, because the integration of these capabilities, on the one hand, is uh, very useful in case you actually want to have a clear picture of what is going on on the orbit or end on the ground. On the other hand, it, if this is done in a somewhat closed manner of integration between like-minded partner, partners by allies and so on, definitely those who believe that them are in the crosshairs of such developments will not be happy about it, simply because you, you, you have uh, added value of this other capability and you if the the decisions being made in that regard uh, i'm pretty sure that they uh, can be very again benign they can be focused on uh, peaceful use of outer space but it definitely can lead to a growing number of counter space capabilities eventually so how to achieve uh, the end goal of uh, stop and reversal of uh, militarization, weaponization of outer space I, in this case. Again, I think transparency about missions, transparency about capabilities, and also transparency about concerns. I mean, uh, I will not uh, ever get tired of saying that uh, we have so many examples where that uh, when, countries when country A has concerns and country B ignores them, it leads to a very dramatic uh, outcome. So again, we, it's good that we are having discussion here. It's good that there are discussions. They have been discussions in OEWG, in JGE. And I think the fact that everyone acknowledges that the value of the discussions themselves is somewhat a good sign. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think, I think it's perhaps also important to sort of tease out uh, dual use um, and dual purpose sort of 
a little bit again for for those who've not really heard of the definition. So due use is a satellite that's already intended upon launch to serve both military and civilian purposes and dual purpose is a satellite that's primarily designed for benign purposes, but could potentially be repurposed to harm other space objects. I think those definitions make sense, but I think we also should not forget that as soon as a satellite, for example, stops communicating and becomes a piece of space debris, that is potentially also harmful to all other satellites because space debris is not political, right? It doesn't distinguish between friend or foe if it hits another satellite um, that is that is another collision we need to deal with. And I think specifically with debris, which I think has become the sort of focus element of this dual use, dual purpose um, discussion over the last couple of years, because ultimately I think it could potentially also hinder discussions we're having about sustainability and what we do with debris pieces that are already out there, right? Um, I think robotic arms have become a sort of matter of discussion um, for the last couple of years. And obviously we do need to find solutions to get the larger pieces of debris that are no longer, you know, maneuverable. We need to find ways to sort of get them out of orbit safely, either do graveyard orbit or being able um, to release them through the atmosphere. So I think we need to be very careful here that we don't get so caught up in those discussions that we're actually hindering process um, progress on sustainability as well. So I think, again, communication and transparency is going to be key. Um, you know, for example, if there is uh, a mission, for example, to test such a debris removal procedure, do tell everyone and do make sure that that is communicated clearly um, with specifics about the particular orbit that is taking place in. Thank you. Um, before I go open up two questions from the audience, I want to see if Krista had some thoughts on this matter, because I know she's done some research on this. Thanks. I'll jump jump in with uh, I, a lot of this has already been kind of alluded to already. Um, but I, one of the things is thinking about um, the, you know, given the dual purpose nature of many of these space objects um, and the perception that any object could be dual purpose, uh, you know, means that their, their mere presence and technical operations are not enough to provide a, a view of intent. Uh, so this kind of goes into that conversation uh, that I, I think was part of the conversation yesterday too, um, on technical capabilities and looking at, you know, limiting capability development versus behaviors. Um, so as these technical capabilities continue to, continue to evolve, um, limitations on uh, this technical limitations, I guess, will become a moving target or ineffective. So uh, when we talk about transparency, uh, it, it's going to be difficult to say that the transparency should be in what the system is technically capable of doing. That's part of it. Um, but we need to look at what the system is actually doing or going to do as well. So as Juliana just said, uh, you know, communication of of upcoming maneuvers, transparency of the nature of these maneuvers, what is the intent? Are we testing something? That's where this transparency is going to be really important. Um, where the technical capabilities come in, then is in the is in the verification and monitoring piece of this. With better space situational awareness enabled by these technical solutions, there could be better verification and monitoring and better awareness of behavior in space is going to help deter actors with nefarious intent through uh, the threat of you know, geopolitical costs of following through. So, so SSA and looking at um, how we can use te technical capabilities to support that, I think are going to help push this forward. Yeah, just like a, a short point that, uh, again, on the mix up between sustainability and security, uh, I think we've all, see, we've all seen arguments that even some anti-satellite tests were labeled as something that is being done to support sustainability, basically take out a satellite that in other cases could have led to some uh, negative consequences. This is one point. And another point is that, well, uh, I can uh, only agree that debris removal capabilities are one of the greatest challenges here because uh, like uh, within the academia, within the expert community, we often joke that, well, eventually you need debris removal capabilities that will be capable of chasing de debris uh, that are changing their orbits and fight back. So basically, like the link between debris removal capabilities and uh, anti-satellite and, and missile defense capabilities is there. And how to address it personally, I think, again, the only way to, and I, Happy to hear that I'm not the only one thinking uh, this way. The only way to do it is basically to be more transparent about it, about what you're doing. 
Right now, I'm, I'm going to change over and open up to the audience for questions. So if there are thoughts, you can raise your placard. We have a placard. A couple placards are up, but we also have one person who's very patiently been waiting online to ask their questions. So I'm going to ask them first. And this is actually for Andrew Peebles. Um, space security four are not the same as those dealing with space safety. Um, you mentioned success of the LTS guidelines. Um, yesterday, it was brought up that they, um, by um, some of the speakers, that LTS partially draw from the um, the GGE and TCBMs that was approved in 2013. So what can we learn from the LTS process for future successes in the space security domain? Thank you. The ultimate question, right? Um, I mean, just from an overview perspective, it's, it's clear that there are, um, I think Juliana mentioned this before, challenges around political will in the, in the security context. And from what we see in Vienna is that Corpus continues to deliver. It, takes a lot of time, very slowly at snail's pace, um, like most UN entities and bodies and intergovernmental fora, but it does continue to deliver and it delivers with international consensus. Um, one of the, the speakers kind of mentioned the fact that um, the need for greater kind of focal points and um, networks between um, on things like space, situa space situational awareness. And we've just talked briefly there about active debris removal. Obviously, it will be for member states to decide um, the the appropriate fora for those discussions to take place. Um, in Vienna, we see similar um, examples whereby member states talk about the militarization of outer space, and there was some um, long-term sustainability guidelines in 2019 that were um, not agreed because they were considered to be um, security focus. Um, what, I will leave it. I'll leave it there because it's a it's a hot potato for the UN to talk about. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so let's move to in person or the delegation from China. I think was the first one. Their placards up. Um, thanks, uh, Victoria, for giving me the floor. And uh, I, I noticed uh, during your uh, introduction at the beginning, uh, you said uh, the uh, space security, safety, and sustainability cannot be achieved through any single initiatives. Uh, uh, I agree with that, but but when we uh, focused on uh, space security in particular, those related to global global strategic stability and arms control, which uh, Dimitri put it as uh, hard security, uh, I think that that can be uh, uh, achieved only uh, through the negotiation of a legal binding instrument on perils in a a comprehensive and effective manner. I think that this uh, 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 views has been shared by the majority of the developing NAM countries. And uh, China just uh, released uh, a, uh, formally a proposal on the uh, uh, reform and the development of a global governance. And uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, some, some uh, uh, proposals I, uh, on, uh, that relevant to uh, space security, I would uh, summarize uh, for your information. One is to oppose the weaponization uh, and arms race in uh, outer space, and we support the, the early negotiation, negotiation of uh, LBI on perils uh, at, at the CD. And the uh, second point is the countries that are major players in outer space should take up uh, primary responsibility for safeguarding peace and security in outer space. And third point is that China supports the UN in giving full play to its role as the main platform for uh, global governance and international cooperation on outer space. Having said that, I would raise a question for uh, Dimitri. As you touched the uh, uh, strategic dimension uh, in your presentation, uh, that is, we know, you know some uh, initiatives or processes are initiated by uh, mainly by uh, some nuclear weapon states. And uh, so uh, my question is, uh, what practical uh, tools uh, could be uh, utilized or established to uh, address the, you know, space security or you said uh, hard security uh, in a comprehensive and effective manner, taking into account uh, uh, the uh, strategic stability and safeguarding common security and safety and sustainability at a broad range. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, well, of course, the best way to do it uh, is definitely to prevent weaponization of space uh, in general, but we are quite far from that. Uh, so some first steps uh, can be like the, the, I'll just reiterate some of the points that I've mentioned and add some more. I think the uh, warnings and uh, notifications about uh, some experiments and tests that happen in orbit, uh, ban on uh, threatening uh, the nuclear command controlled communications, including uh, one of the ways to look at it is including uh, to, of addressing uh, some things like left of launch concept where basically space infrastructure is uh, definitely plays a role as an enabler for so-called uh, counter counterforce capabilities that are sometimes labeled as a part of missile defense. So basically we understand uh, the reason how uh, our American partners came up with this idea. And well, it's not, they're not the only country they have looked at the problem of missile defense and air defense in this way, basically take out the weapons that threaten you before they actually in flight. But the issue is that, well, Earth is a big planet and space is uh, huge. But uh, you cannot draw a line between this or that capability that is aimed at uh, this or that threat. Anyone who perceives themselves as a possible uh, target of this or that concept or this or that capability will take uh, ac uh, active efforts uh, to develop counter capabilities. And again, we are back into arms racing dynamics. We are back to security dilemma. How to address it? Well, we need to discuss this concept. Uh, I think one of the ways to do it is that, uh, to some extent, it's being already done within the P5, as far as I understand. There is a discussion on doctrines, there is a discussion on concepts, both through official channels and through expert community and academia. Uh, we are definitely far from concluding these discussions and uh, achieving some sort of uh, results, but still, uh, personally, I am. Uh, I think one of the priorities should be not the discussion of uh, doctrines in general and capabilities in general, but addressing specific things where which are considered to be questionable and extremely uh, destabilizing. In space, those are uh, rela uh, 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 the, the important ones are those that are related to well strategic weapons and to prevention of. Uh, possible sex, second strike capabilities to undermining those. Uh, well, I think this is the only, uh, the primary thing that we, it, we can do. And I would also reiterate the idea that we might develop some sort of a negative doctrine that we will never use space capabilities to, or terrestrial space related capabilities to threaten nuclear control, uh, command controlled communications. Uh, it is not something verifiable, definitely, at least at the moment. But still, it can be a good sign and it can support to build trust. Because eventually, I am, uh, what I'm 100% sure is that none of the nuclear weapon states, especially none of the uh, NPT nuclear weapon states, which are luckily also permanent members of the UN Security Council, uh, are interested in actually fighting a nuclear war. At least we have a, f a public statement that nuclear war cannot be won and, and thus it should never be fought. And that I think I'll stop. Uh, again, there are no easy answers, but we need to take small steps and move towards greater stability. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, actually, I want to build upon that question and extend it to um, Juliana and Krista. And then, Juliana, you brought up partnerships, which we haven't heard too much about, but the idea, you know, based on our, the delegations from China's question about what kind of practical tools do you see for space security, you brought up partnerships. And Krista, you brought up the idea of improving bilateral relations. So I was wondering if both of you could kind of expand upon that based on the, the question from the audience. Uh, do you want to go first, Juliana? Yeah, You're just, sitting right next to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, happy to. I mean, I think it goes back to, to my point from earlier, um, talking about space as a sort of secretive domain sometimes. And I think, um, Overclassification can sort of lead to conspiracy theories, and I think overclassification can also hinder effective partnerships. Um, but I think if we if we work on that together and if we foster more partnerships and more collaboration on space, um, I think we're all we're all set to gain from that. We know that space is expensive. We know that space is hard to do. Um, we keep reiterating, reiterating these phrases, um, but we keep reiterating them because it, it's important to remember them. So I think, you know. 
partnerships and collaboration on space, I think, can only help us sort of understand how we all work. It can help us sort of gain from, from the capabilities from our partners. Um, and it also helps us sort of understand how we all, how we all work, how we conceptualize space, um, and hopefully gain more trust also in how we work together. Um, I think even even in sort of future scenarios, you may not be working with the same partner you worked with 20 years ago, but you already know exactly the sort of processes they would be going through. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Krista, thoughts about the bilateral relationships? Yeah, I think a, a, a really key benefit, there's many of them for developing these, these relationships, um, but in thinking about space in particular and in thinking about um, uh, stability, increasing this increasing the stakes for everybody, I, how, developing partnerships so that there's there's not only better information sharing, but but helping other countries uh, understand that they have skin in the game and helping them have skin in the game, helping them develop capabilities so that there's more of a uh, building towards a common objective. If I, the, the more we all collectively have at risk in, in space, I guess, the more collectively we, we understand that um, any debris generation is going to impact us all, um, that I think the, the more stable we're, we're going to be. Uh, so, yeah, developing these partnerships so that you know, people understand that, that you know, we all have skin in the game here. Um, and, and, and further, I think working with different countries on space cooperation is is really a great opportunity for uh, building broader trust with them. You know, out, outside of thinking space security, more geopolitical security. There's a real um, there's a real path for understanding each other on a broader level there as well. Thank you, Krista and um, Andrew. You had some thoughts on this matter. Thanks. Just one practical tool on bringing bringing countries together. Um, not sure colleagues will have seen, but the the long term sustainability guidelines and guideline. Guideline B1 does set up um, a national focal point network for um, contact information related to um, the designated entities and authorities that engage in more or less space, situa space situational awareness. So that's in relation to on-orbit spacecraft operations, conjunction assessments, and monitoring, op monitoring of objects. It also looks at um, calls on member states to nominate entities responsible for processing um, incoming incident reports um, and forecasts and adopting precautionary and response measures. Um, guidelines B2 do focus on um, improving the accuracy of orbital data, sharing that data um, and enhancing that data um, practice. Guideline B3 does also talk about the, the sharing and collection and dissemination of space debris monitoring information. So what you see there within the LTS guidelines is the basis for um, member states coming together, coordinating, discussing the, the basic principles of space situational awareness. So I would encourage everybody to use existing mechanisms such as that. Um, the other point which one of the panelists mentioned earlier was around terminology and understanding that, that member states, how, how can member states come together to understand um, issues? Um, one of the, the practical examples from the long-term sustainability working group one um, was the establishment of um, a translation and terminology reference group. And that led to extensive meetings between member states and the UN interpretation unit to understand how we can uh, member states can approach um, the topic of long-term sustainability of outer space activities. And there was a UN agreed definition on um, long-term sustainability adopted through that working group. And then finally, the, the third um, practical tool, um, Victoria, you mentioned earlier, was the, the digitized um, UN register of objects launched into outer space. For the last 50 years, um, we've been collecting notovabals from member states, um, paper-based formats. We have two storage rooms in a noosa full of dusty old papers, which um, if you probably walk into that room, you'll get you'll get a health scare. Um, we're, we're digitizing the UN register that will be launched in 2024. So again, this is hopefully a practical tool whereby member states can more effectively and efficiently share information with one another. Thank you. On partnerships, I would also add that uh, there is always an issue uh, about uh, inclusive and exclusive partnerships, uh, because, as I've said earlier, more often than not, each and every partnership between like political or strategic adversaries 
or possible adversaries are perceived as a challenge. Uh, we have an uh, example of, for example, uh, with uh, r r joint Russian and China, uh, not joint, but Russia supporting Chinese efforts to develop early warning capability. Uh, we have uh, similar capability, uh, it, not similar, but actually joint capability being developed by uh, the US, uh, South Korea, and uh, Japan. Uh, at the same time, previously, like more than 20 years ago, there was a plan to have a joint Russia-US early warning capability. Uh, so uh, my point is that with all these uh, things that are definitely important not only for like missile defense or missile launch warning, but also for space directional awareness, at least on a political level, on a diplomatic level, uh, statements about their non targeting of third parties, statements about possibility of uh, some sort of inter integration or at least interaction between these joint systems uh, would be an important uh, st first step. Because, like as uh, Andrew mentioned, there is national focal points for space traditional winners, and in some countries, in Russia and US, there are national risk reduction centers. Uh, in some agreements, for example, between Russia and China on the notification of uh, ballistic missile launches and space launches, uh, I I this agreement also provides for a sort of a national focal point through which the notifications will move through. I think the, one of the easiest way to do it is basically to establish some sort of uh, joint system of these focal points about which will send notifications to each other which is not easy, but at least some countries uh, seem to be more ready to that, and I think eventually it might be a good first step, because, again, hard arms control, legally binding mechanisms are the best, but and should be an end goal, but it doesn't mean that we should not make small steps. Small progress is still progress, right? Uh, there's a question in the front here from Peter Martinez. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. Um, fascinating discussion. I've really enjoyed uh, listening to all the, the comments uh, and views expressed by the panelists. So um, I have a question for, for Andrew about the registration um, process in the UN, and then also just wanted to um, uh, pick up on um, share some views as the former chair of the LTS process. There was a question about lessons learned that could perhaps um, be useful in other contexts. Um, so look, looking back on the LTS process, which was a, a eight, eight going on nine year process, um, there, there were some interesting uh, things that we did that I think contributed to the successful outcome of that. Um, I would say that um, one of the key contributors of that was that when we developed the guidelines, um, we did this in a bottom up approach. So we, the working group established a series of expert groups these expert groups were populated by experts nominated by the um, delegations, but the experts were there in their own personal uh, ad hominem capacity as experts. They were not necessarily expressing national positions. However, we did operate the expert groups under the consensus rules of COPOS, meaning that we needed consensus from all the experts that there was a, an acknowledged best practice that could be recommended as a candidate guideline. And these expert groups then put forward a series of candidate guidelines that were referred to the working group. And mostly the candidate guidelines were uh, accepted by the working group, not all of them, but most of them. And the first 16 of 21 um, guidelines, sorry, the first 11 uh, guidelines that emerged from that expert group process. And so I think the, that bottom-up discussion among experts where there are common concerns, um, agreed uh, technical approaches to dealing with these concerns is a, um, a fruitful uh, way forward. We also um, took a great effort to socialize the idea of space sustainability, which was not clear to many delegations at the start of the process. Uh, a number of delegations, uh, frankly, um, had different, th there were two, two different kinds of views about this. One was that um, the whole issue of inv space environmental concerns were being used as a pretext to preserve the advantage of the 
uh, already established space nations, and so therefore coming up with new rules essentially to raise the barrier to entry for emerging space nations. It took a while to get uh, folks to understand that space sustainability is everybody's concern. Um, then there was um, also uh, some other uh, concerns around or views that uh, the, the debris situation in space had been created by the advanced spacefaring nations, and so therefore they should be the ones that should um, deal with the issue. Of course, it's everybody's problem and not just those of the established nations. So that took a few years to socialize that. But we also um, uh, made sure that we tried to make the process as inclusive as possible, and the expert groups provided a way for a very wide range of countries with different levels of space capabilities and different priorities to find one or more expert groups in which they could contribute to the process of developing these guidelines. And so the, getting that, uh, that ensured the sort of the very broad buy-in. Um, on the matter of definitions, um, it's very interesting. We started the discussion in COPWOS, uh, again with, uh, as, um, uh, as, as Dimitri mentioned, um, th th there were two, two sorts of approaches to this. One approach was that we should agree on the definitions up front of space sustainability, and there was another view that um, was that we should just start working on these guidelines. Um, we really struggled to come up with a definition of space sustainability in the beginning, and that's, looking back on it with hindsight, it's because the whole, our whole shared understanding of what we mean by space sustainability was still evolving. And so, although in the final documents with the guidelines, space sustainability is defined in the first section of the document, in fact, that was one of the last things that we reached agreement on in the LTS process. Um, and those of you who are familiar with the Brundtland Report and the definition of sustainable development on Earth, you will notice a parallel between the definition of space sustainability and the definition of sustainable development on Earth. And uh, that was something that I think was, uh, was very helpful in the end in drawing the connection between those discussions of sustainability in very different parts of the UN system. Um, so then coming to, to my question for, for Andrew, um, I, I'm, I'm very interested to know how the, um, the office is um, coping with the greatly increased number of registrations from, you know, these very large satellite constellations where you are having constant replacements of satellites. Uh, it's just the, the volume of work must be expanding exponentially. And so I'm just curious to know how, how is the office coping with that? Do you need more resources? Is this something that member states should be calling for? Thank you. I'm always scared about getting questions from you, Peter, because you're such a, an expert in all things LTS. But um, <laughs> thanks. Um, I mean, I'm not going to be one of these um, UN civil servants that say, please, can we have some more money? Because that never works with, with busy diplomats. Um, so, but I'm going to say that we are coping with the number of, of launches um, and the number of notifications to the Secretary General. But um, the, the word I would highlight is, is coping for now. Um, because what we're seeing is, yes, an exponential growth in, in the launch of mega constellations. We might see, for example, um, Copuous in the coming years um, look at streamlining the process for registering um, mega constellations. So, for, exa for example, as, as countries move towards developing um, serial lines, uh, mass production or serial licensing of, of satellites, it may just be a case of saying, look, we're notifying this block um, on as a, as, a, as a constellation in and of itself. But one of the things that we're doing as well is through this um, interview series and stakeholder study that we're doing in partnership with, uh, thanks to the funding of the United Kingdom, is we're looking at um, the different approaches that member states will be taking to this topic, both at the national level within their national registers and supplementary registers, for example, and then how they do that with, um, with the United Nations. Because I think we can all agree that um, submitting a, a single notification on every single satellite and then ANUSA having to verify whether through space track whether it is where it's a member state says it is or a state party says it is isn't isn't um, necessarily the most efficient um, process but there is a working group in Corpus on the status of the five treaties and this is one of the topics which is currently under discussion thanks
Thank you. And then just going on to, you know, back to what Peter said about lessons learned. I mean, that seems it's very relevant to the discussions we've seen on space security at the multilateral level and that, you know, there's been a need to um, socialize the idea that space security is everyone's interest and responsibility, much like space sustainability. And um, the idea of inclusivity and having a way in which interest from in various um, stakeholders, whether they're users of space data, launchers of space satellites, or just um, owning um, information from satellites, you know, how can they get their input and their needs part of the conversation for space security and stability? And then the idea of not reinventing the wheel in terms of, you know, definitions and that sort of thing. Um, I know when we work on, people work on space, I always like to think it's a special snowflake type thing where, you know, nothing has ever been done before, but actually there's a lot of stuff that can be built upon. And so thank you, Peter, for that assessment. I think we're getting close to the session. We had one very enthusiastic hand in the back. Uh, sir, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know you. Could you give your name and affiliation and ask your question to the panel? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sergey Gukaev, I'm, I'm working in a, in a company named Clear Space, so I will, I'll, I'll have it to, we, we are developing the practical solutions for addressing the space sustainability and space debris. And uh, my question to, to Andrew as well, uh, but a little bit of small comment before that. Um, the, the current situation in, the, in addressing the space sustainability is a bit fragmented. So you have on one side European Space Agency that is working on the mission to remove space debris. You have UK National Space Agency working on a program to remove the space debris. And you have Japanese Space Agency working on a mission to remove uh, their space debris or demonstrate capabilities. So um, other than that, there are no other big initiatives. So um, my question, my question uh, the current guidelines uh, in different, in, uh, on the non-government level or on the on the intergovernment level, are are not are not legally binding to the to the member states. So my question is a bit naive, but what, how the process should look like on on the on the on the member states level that that these these guidelines are becoming more stringent to the operators and to the governments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah answer it as best you want and um, maybe give your final thoughts on that. And then for the rest of the panel, if you can talk about the idea of how do you have these ideas about space security and stability, these, um, these concepts of sharing information, but a way in which it's not hinging upon the space actors in a, in a manner that impedes their access to space as a larger role. So these tools, how can it be helpful, but not too helpful? Uh, Andrew, can you take that please? Thanks. Um... So yeah, good question, Sergey. I mean, the question about is something legally binding and therefore do we need to implement it is is always kind of, it's under discussion all the time um, as, as we see it within the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. But as per every political declaration or resolution or um, guidelines or principles that are adopted at the UN level, um, they're done so at least through copious by consensus on behalf of all member states and done so with... Um, uh, political will. So again, it comes down to the political will of, of member states to to follow up on, in terms of the LTS guidelines, 10 years worth of negotiations and implement those at the national level. And that's exactly what we're seeing through through the, the LTS working group 2.0, that member states are actually sharing information with one another on how they're implementing this at the national level. And it will just take time to kind of um, be mainstreamed. Um, the other thing that we have is a project, again, funded by the United Kingdom Space Agency on the, the implementation of the, the LTS guidelines. And one of the things that that project does, and you can find it on spacesustainability.anusa.org, is develop case studies on how industry in particular member states um, and intergovernmental um, organizations are implementing the, the guidelines within their respective um, contexts. And I think Astroscale was one of those companies which which did talk about how it did so, uh, how it implemented the guidelines. So um, I would just continue this exchange of information. And I think um, and as a final comment, I would say thank you again to the organizers for having me. Thank you. And Anusa. Uh, yeah, I, actually, it's uh, really nice how you put it helpful but not too helpful because of course there is always a concern about like that some errors might be too intrusive but at this on the other hand some errors might be just like purely symbolic without any actual tangible effect uh, again looking at other domains where we have seen successes and failures of arms control and risk reduction i believe it is crucial to have 
built-in mechanisms for fine-tuning this or that instruments. Uh, because otherwise, uh, we see a situation when this or that country decides that they are no that this or that instrument no longer uh, helps th them, and they simply like withdraw or violate or whatever. So it is crucial to, especially given how fragile actually space is, and space domain is, and how it affects again all of the Earth, all of the, all of the humankind. It is crucial to have uh, ways to fine-tune whatever the nation-states can agree upon, because otherwise it will always be prone to uh, real or alleged violations, and uh, any regime uh, will be destroyed by these uh, effects. So I think this is my, my main point, and also thanks for having me. It was a fascinating discussion, and uh, I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I know we've talked a lot about the sort of uh, already existing sort of common understanding that we need to do more, but I think I just want to go back to something that Andrew said earlier, which was about um, how stable legislation and sort of space law has in countries has also led to industry growth. So. I'm hoping that measures like that can sort of incentivize, perhaps as a sort of second order effect, can incentivize um, that states think about their, their conduct in space uh, sort of more sustainably, more in the long term. Um, and again, thank you for having me. And yeah, thanks so much for having me uh, remotely here and for tolerating the, the inconvenience of, of that interaction. Um, the, a lot of great comments here. Um, and uh, giving me back to the how can we be helpful without being too helpful kind of thing. I think the the, the communication of intent is key here, and figuring out what that balance is is a like a extremely nuanced conversation. Right? But I think identifying what we need to share to ensure safety is a, is a good first step. What information needs to be shared, and when, and do we have the mechanism for sharing that? Um, you know, when are you going to maneuver? How soon do you need to notify that? How much in advance? All of those things are safety oriented, and if we can uh, continue to capitalize on a shared understanding of the importance of safety, I think that can help guide um, at how we uh, how we share information. So, thank you very much for letting me participate in this panel. This has been uh, a, a lot of fun, a great discussion. I appreciate it. Great, thank you for staying up all night. Um, we were close to you in LA. Um, I'd like the, um, everyone to join me in thanking our panelists for a fantastic discussion. Thank you.